four, three, two, one, zero. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Live from the heart of the downtown east side, it's Talk Recovery Radio with Giuseppe Gansi and Darren Gaylor on Vancouver's co-op radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. From the streets to the studio, bringing you addiction recovery stories from real people with lived experience and real experts on today's issues. Tune in live every Thursday, noon to one. Powered by New West Recovery. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. And good afternoon, Vancouver. Hello, you're listening to Talk Recovery Radio on Vancouver Co-op Radio FM. Hey, Darren, how's it going? Hey, hey, nice to be back. Just that nice to be back. Uh... Yeah, it's been a while. Yes, like about a month, I think we haven't been on on air. It was a live yeah, show, anyway. Being live on Facebook, yeah, yeah. I mean, here we are. A little bit of a little bit of news, some something to report. A, a, a new guest. I mean, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and remembering how to do everything, we had a bit of a slow start. So for those somebody's already commented, our our first fiasco at going live after a month of not doing it, a little bit of a headache. Just a small one. <laughs> You're the control booth master. Yes. Well, I wouldn't say master, right? You know, if anybody wants to make a donation to co-op radio so we can hire a uh, full-time audio engineer, that would be awesome. You can go to co-opradio.org and, you know, they're always looking for donations for the studio where it's uh, uh, our show airs because they give us some time, uh, which is uh, powered by New West Recovery, but uh, there's no commercials or anything like that. So uh, the whole show runs by donations from or the whole station does anyway. So yeah, I wanted to talk to everybody before we start with our first guest. Wanted to talk about uh, Recovery Day BC, and uh, no, I don't want to talk about Recovery Day BC. Got so much stuff going on, Darren. We want to talk about Recovery Month Canada. We're way beyond BC now. <laughs> there you. Go. Well, it started there. <laughs> it started there 10 years ago yeah 10 years ago was the 10th anniversary of this year you're right it did start there actually in 2014 um was the first time uh, recovery advocates tried to get recovery month passed in ottawa and it was a voted no and then some of us uh regrouped in ottawa right the day before COVID hit uh, in March, I think it was March 12th of 2020 or 2019, whatever that year was, and uh, 2020, sorry. And we tried to um, we begin. tried to get the motion passed again. And a few months later, it got brought to the House and it got voted no again. And I was just like, this is kind of weird. Like, why are they, I mean, we've got months for pretty much everything, but why aren't they giving us a recovery month? And we had a meeting with Ottawa about it and uh, Health Canada. And they literally said these words. We've shared this on the show before. Um, and not that Health Canada runs the House of Commons, but there's this narrative in Ottawa um, where they said recovery is not the mandate of this current government. And I was just like, what does that even mean? So like, you know, is remission the, the, the mandate for cancer? Like, wouldn't you think that would be the mandate for addiction? Um, so anyway, we kept on fighting and kept on fighting and got louder and louder and louder. That's recovery day, you know, just a couple months ago here, a couple blocks from here in BC. And so we had motion 10 go to the House of Commons and it got passed finally. So September is now Recovery Month Canada. Yeah. Not bad, eh? Not bad at, all. Not bad at all. About time. Hmm? Yeah. Like, well, know? it is. You know, and you have a big part in that, Darren, too. I, I mean, if it wasn't for your participation and getting that crowd motivated for recovery, I mean, not everybody in that crowd's in recovery. You know, they come to the, the curiosity, and uh, like everybody had an amazing time. And so the main question is like, why do we need a recovery month? All right. It's the main mm -hmm. question. And the truth of the matter is, you know, we we get the same question in the Pride movement, like, why is there a Pride Month? 
And so, you know, I'm thinking what we can do, Darren, is we can answer that question in the second half of the show. You know, why do we need a recovery month? And if anybody's listening and anybody wants to put a comment in or anything like that, by all means, put a comment in. But uh, yeah, why why do we need a recovery month? I mean, I know the answer to it, but, uh, you know, let's, I'd like to hear what your answer is. But There may be a few answers. To okay, that. perfect. So we'll talk about that later on after our right first on. guest. Um, and uh, we're going to bring our first guest into the show and uh, Darren who are we talking recovery with today on Talk Recovery Radio All right we get to talk recovery and welcome Joel Soper to the show uh, he is an author of a book entitled Never Enough Zeros a tale of tragedy and inspiration in the struggle against gambling addiction Joel welcome to the show man Hey guys thanks for having me all right. I love the title, by the way, Never Enough Zeros. Uh, it speaks to yeah. uh, any gambling addict. They understand that right off the bat. It's, I mean, even, you know, even the mantra of, of a, a, an addiction to drugs, it's there's never enough, never enough of anything. Right. Um, right. So before we get into like, you know, specifically the book and its purpose and why you wrote it, um, question of like gambling addiction. Um you know, when we talk about addiction, oftentimes we pool together alcohol and substances, you know, and then, and then you hear gambling. Now, are you like solely gambling addict or was there other addictions in, in your story? No other addiction. Never, never did a drug, never drank. I mean, I drank once, but I didn't like the taste of it. It was just gambling. That was it. That was my that was my DOC, my drug of awesome. I, I was hoping that was it because I mean, quite often, like I said, the, the gambling, you know, guys with gambling addictions, it, it's a secondary addiction. And you know, you, you hear there's always a you know a pool of alcohol in there and other substances. And I'm so curious of of the gambling addict, like primarily. Uh, because you don't hear, you know, uh, the hereditary gambling part, like, oh, I'm a gambler because my dad's a gambler and his dad's a gambler. So like, I'm, I'm curious, and, and I'm not looking for a medical response here, but just from your own, your own opinion, what, like, like you were just a regular everyday guy and, 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 and got hooked on the gambling or, you know, did it slowly you know, start with cards, like, tell us the little, how did it begin? So how it began was, I grew up in um, Livonia, Michigan, okay, right outside of Detroit. Okay. Oh, and, my goodness, uh, my, my neighborhood. <laughs> uh, you're from Michigan? From Windsor, Ontario. Oh, there you go. You're our yeah, neighbor. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we would go over there as soon as we turned 19. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll yeah, talk about that after. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was that was just to have a little fun. But um yeah, so in in Livonia, it just everybody gambled on sports. And one of my best friends' dad was the biggest bookie in the Detroit area. So I went to work for him at the age of 16, writing down bets, because that's what you used to do back in the day, is they would call in and there was only two options. You could bet the side or the total. And uh, that's what I did. And that's how I got involved in that life. How old were you then? 16. 16. Okay. So, I mean, that comes with, you know, the types of fellas that are, you know, being in, a, in, in the bookie room, right? Like, that energy, there's, you would say there was a culture, you know, that you sort of got into uh, uh, as a young, as a young guy. Yeah, they were gangsters, you yeah. know, um, these are the type of guys that, you know, you didn't want to owe a large sum of money to. So. <laughs> Fair, enough. Fair enough. And, and yeah. because, you know, it's, it's like they say, you know, cocaine is addictive, but I know many, many people who tried cocaine and didn't turn into an addict, right? So I was, right. you know, curious, did you just walk into a casino and place a bet and were hooked? But that defines it, like from a young sort of de developing man, like, you know, like you were amongst, 
you know, this whole scene of, of gambling and sports gambling, I guess, uh, you know, more specifically, did, did it become something like casinos or slots or blackjack specifically? Did it come in all ranges or, or was it always mainly, you know, sports betting? It was mainly sports betting. However, um, one of the first uh, things that got me real hooked was a horse race. Um, my, my bookies, the guys that I worked for, would have a table at the clubhouse. And they would be there every single day. And um, this one day, I went up there. And I was underage because you had to be 18 to get into the clubhouse, but I maneuvered my way in through a window <laughs> and uh, I, I got to their table and uh, they had a tip on a race this particular day. Name of the horse was bring on the rain. And uh, I bet $20 on that horse to win. And the horse was at five to one. And um, I'll never forget it because the uh, race went off. And all of a sudden it started raining and I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. Cause the horse's name is bring on the rain and uh, the horse wins by five lengths. I win the bet. And that was it. I was hooked <laughs> on game forever. I'm like, oh, that's a sign right there. Oh, man, that's a sign. It. It, it is. It, it's, it's the, the sort of coming to age story that you hear, you know, your first, you know, drink a beer with your dad or like the sneaking into a racetrack, at, you know, underage and, and winning a bat. Like, I mean, I'm hooked already. You know what I mean? Just, <laughs> yeah. just living in that, in that idea. Um, and, and so it's interesting. So, you know, like, and, and this is very familiar with, you know, people being, you know, sort of impressionable, right? Like in a time when, and something exciting happens that like, you know, it's a big part of the, the addiction or, or, you know, what's to come, right? Like, you know, that's not just something you're going to walk away from and, and, you know, maybe, maybe try it again a couple of years later. Like you're, you, how soon did you go back to the racetrack? Oh, I, I was hooked. I was going back <laughs> the, every day. I was there the next day. Yeah. But, did, you, uh, did you learn to walk right through the door or were you still sneaking in the window? Oh no, I, I, they had this window open. I mean, it was my same go-to every time, you know, and uh, I just snuck in for years. And the problem is, is that I looked young too. So I was always afraid that they were going to be like, you got to get the hell out of here. But I think what happened over time is they saw me with the bookies and they, you know, right. then they, then they didn't fuck with me anymore. Excuse my language. I didn't mean yes. to swear. Yeah. We're, we're live on radio. That's okay. Um, so you know, it's it's romanticizing gambling, you know, bookies and crime and, you know, all. So, you know, a lot of people think addiction is about the substance, you know, but how, I mean, I'm just listening. And I'm like, that sounds really cool. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't mind sitting at that table having, you know, of whatever you drink and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we're. And did that play a big role for you? And we lost your video there. Did that play a big role for you? Like the atmosphere that you were in? Yeah, it really did. You know, I was just, just the smelling of the corned beef, uh, just everything about it was just so intoxicating, you know? And yeah. I just, I, I love that feeling so much. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the whole gamut of the, the bedding, the smoke from the cigars, yeah. the, you know, uh, the corned beef, pastrami, everything about it was just really, really addicting right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine the acceptance from the, from the old dog guys, you know, that are, uh, you know, telling you to come sit down or, you know, giving you, you know, high fives for winning or whatever. Like, and, and this, like I said, it's a, a familiar beginning. What was your first sort of, you know, ma major consequence or problem that happened? Did you, did, did this, you know, was it an exciting time for, for a while or did it come quick with, with a big blow? Um, you know, like any other addiction, it's progressive, right? Yeah. So my first big blow, and this is a reoccurring 
you know, theme of my, my life, especially my adult life with gambling, there came trouble. And my freshman year in college, I was selling drugs to finance, you know, my gambling. And I didn't do drugs, but I, I was selling them. And, and I'm a, a white suburban kid that, you know, has no business doing anything like that. But, but the gambling uh, addiction drove me to do things to make quick money to finance my gambling. And inevitably, I got caught up and got in some trouble. And I uh, ended up uh, facing some pretty hefty charges. Oh, okay. Was that enough to get you to stop gambling? Or anything? Uh, no, no. You know, it didn't, you, you know, I, I've had so many things that have transpired in my life that should have made me quit gambling that, uh, you wouldn't believe, I mean, from, you know, going to jail to getting beat up constantly by bookies or enforcers and, uh, ended up in the hospital to, you know, just being in some very dangerous situations. And, and how old were you when all this was going on? Well, the first bit of trouble when I got into was when I was 18 and that was my freshman year in college and then what transpired is that I moved out to California to um, start my business and that's when the real trouble started to happen so I'm trying to put like a time frame here so what was what was it did you try to get any help back what was asking for help like back then when you were like in your 18 you know between 18 and 25 like compared to what it could be like today was was the option even there any conversations any knowledge anything did you ask for help that's a great question um you know back then you know i didn't ask for help and i don't even know if the options were there back then like it is today. So, you know, 18 to 25, you know, in that particular instance, I didn't go to jail and I, I got uh, probation and um, I um, never asked for help and I just went on with my life. So to answer your question, there, there was nothing that I did to try to seek help. And I don't remember if, you know, the help was so readily available like it is today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah imagine that's the only help you're looking for in those situations is like a good lawyer, you know. <laughs> well, there's no, there was, there was no conversations. I mean, hence recovery right. day and recovery month and all that. Con- I remember, you know, not understanding anything about addiction or alcoholism, you know, at the, at the same ages. And I remember picking somebody up from a building, um, a friend of mine, and uh, years later, like we're talking. 20 years later, you know, I go back home for a visit and, uh, you know, I put all the pieces together. I was helping him escape from a rehab center that existed in Windsor, Ontario. And like, I had no concept that like none, like I uh, didn't know what rehab was, what recovery was, you know, and, you know, he, he, you know, it's, it's taken a lot of energy from a lot of people, including someone like you who wrote a book to, to get the conversations out there because people honestly don't know um, until right. they actually, actually have an experience with it um so okay so now we've got all the 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 craziness some people like to call it the step one piece it's like okay you qualify uh so you know before we get into the book uh never enough zeros you know what got you in a place to be able to even write a book like did you go to rehab did you go to a 12-step thing did you psychiatry yoga what what was it that got you to uh (laughs) <laughs> what got what got me to this place, believe it or not, was a bad beat. <laughs> and when okay. I say that, that means I lost the game in the most horrific way that you could imagine. And um, I broke my laptop. I broke my cell phone right after the game, you know, was over because I I, I was mentally baffled, you know, how I could lose this game because statistically it was like a million to one that you know I was not going to lose and they just ended up losing in this crazy fashion so I had no computer I had no laptop because I broke it I almost broke my hand because I punched the wall I was so upset 
And then, you know, I just started writing because I had no communication. And, uh, you know, I wrote pretty much for two days straight as far as is how this book got started. But that's wow. how I quit gambling, <laughs> if you can okay. believe it. Nice. I mean, you, you've, you must have experienced, you know, losses as bad. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, uh, up to that point, like, I, you know, I hear often from from gambling addicts that the that the loss is as big a rush as as a win. And what's your experience on that? Like, I mean, you know, whether it's a win and you're excited and you got more money to bet next or it's a loss and you owe money and you're in despair, like, is it still so, like something that creates the next chase or that, you know, that wants the next bet. Yeah. I mean, that's totally correct. I mean, everything involved with it is addicting, right? Is that, you know, winning or losing at the end of the game, that, that dopamine rush is, is there. Yeah. Then if you do lose, it's like, okay, how am I going to get the money? How am I going to get the money to gamble some more and then you get the money and as you're you know you're driving to the book or to drop it off or however you're you're betting that's a rush so the rush is there continuously throughout the whole process and right. you know to me you know i love i love gambling don't get me wrong you know it it, <laughs> it was my first love it was my first love without a doubt um but you know, to, to go back to your question, yes, I lost plenty of games in a ridiculous fashion because, you know, myself, the way that I bet as I got older and I got a lot more money, you know, I was betting literally like, you know, 15 games a day and maybe like 50 plays inside of those games a day because now you have so many options with the live bettings and all the different propositions. It's not like the old days, like, you know, when I worked for the bookmaker where you bet one game, like, let's say the, you know, Toronto Agronauts, let's go Canadian football are playing the Hamilton Tigers and they're minus three and the under over is 42. That's the only proposition that you can bet. Right. right. So now it's, it, it's a buffet. It, it's crazy. It's just, it's, it's so addicting and it's just, it's, it's nonstop. Yes. But, I mean, so that's, I mean, that's part of your experience. You were there at the old school, you know, got to get to the bookies to place the bet to eventually sitting at home on a laptop, making as many bets as you absolutely can. Like yep. what would, did you, would you say that that like, I mean, it, it, I, w I would assume it's just, it's just awful as far as taking addiction you know, the progression of addiction to a whole new level. Did you experience that? Or did you see it as like a way where you could manage it more? And now I can, you know, I can just be at home. I don't have to be around. You know what I mean? Like, how was that change for you? Did it make you everything worse? Or did it allow you to maintain for a little while? Oh, man, it was the death of me. So okay. I mean, it, it was, it was the crack cocaine. I mean, I, I went from, you know, at least being able to, you know, function as a human being when I had just, you know, a couple plays on some games that were the whole games to being just fixated on my laptop or on my phone, just basically push, pushing buttons to refresh and to place more bets. And now you're talking about, from the time you get up to the time you get to bed, if you can actually sleep because you're so pumped up on gambling that you're in action all day, every day. I mean, right. it's, it, it's just, it's crazy. So to answer your question, it absolutely destroyed me. And, yeah. um, you know, it just went from, you know, four or five plays a day to literally like 60 or 70 plays a day. Mm. And I mean, Do Go ahead, Giuseppe. I, I just wanted to talk about um, another component to all this. Do you find yourself the need to be an advocate to, uh, I, I mean, the government in the States and in Canada, they, you know, they come up with these jingles, play within your limit and all this kind of like add-ons to to gambling i mean you go to the convenience store and it's just you know, you look at all the options you know they 
they know they're making money off losers. Um, so like, do you, do you think that we, like, is there anything we can do to help stop this and all that kind of stuff? Do you get yourself involved in any of the advocacy piece? You know, that's a great question as well. I'm now starting to get more involved. I partnered up with a, a gentleman here in, in Los Angeles who has a, uh, a website, Stop Betting Sports. And um, we're actually doing something next week in Delaware to educate, you know, college students on the, all the risk of, you know, compulsive sports gambling. And uh, California, actually in November, it's going to vote on legalizing sports gambling. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I assume it'll probably pass because of all the money that's involved in it. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's pure greed, right? Because they don't want to lose that money to, you know, offshore or to, you know, illegal bookmakers and they want to yeah, get want, that money. They want to make the money. Right. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same thing with marijuana sales. We don't want to lose the marijuana sales revenue. They're going to buy it anyway. But at what cost? Right. Because, you know, where I right. work, we work in a treatment center and uh, we got called on because in Canada, they legalize sports betting advertising during mm -hmm. sports games. And so all of a sudden, all these sports shows i had online and on on tv i think as well they there's now commercials for sports betting and uh the, the they're just raking in so much money and all that kind of stuff yeah. and so they they wanted to have some chats with you know how does this affect and, and people really don't think um gambling addiction is a big deal you know it's just um you know there's that oh if you're stupid enough to lose all that money it's your fault you know that kind of right stuff like well you're an idiot for spending all your money there and all that kind of stuff but really at the end of the day you know we get calls from wives and and partners and and all that kind of stuff where or even alumni they get to you know find recovery from drugs and alcohol and then get addicted to gambling and they call us up and i spent all my money you know and and uh you know the de the the damage I, are you married kids like did you like what was your what happened to your family and all of this? Well, basically what, what happens, you know, in this whole gambling addiction is you don't have time, at least the extreme people that this happens to like myself. And I'm don't know the, the percentage of people that end up like me, but I'm sure there's a small percentage that do is that you don't have time for a family. You don't have time for relationships. Who's going to be with you when you're constantly in action? You're constantly on your phone. You're constantly, you know, on your laptop gambling. So that goes out the window, okay? Mm -hmm. The family is the first line of offense when it comes to, you know, lying, cheating, and stealing, right? That's where you get your money from when you've lost all your money, whether you're, you're you know, working for someone or in my case, you know, I've always owned businesses and then I'm always forced to sell my businesses because, you know, I'm getting beat up and I'm so far in debt with the bookies that I lie, cheat and steal to get money from my family and friends. So then you lose that. Okay. You lose them out of your life. And then you turn to criminality because of the fact that that's the only place at that point that you can get the money quick that you need. So, you know, to answer your question, you know, I've lost everybody in my life, you know, now, you know, I'm bringing them back because I have some recovery and I, you know, I'm doing the right things. But when you're in that addiction, it just takes all of your time, your energy, just your whole being. I mean, it, it just grabs you and it, it is such an insidious disease. And I don't know about, you know, the numbers or, you know, the different types of addictions, just from what I hear that gambling, you know, I heard it's the hardest to quit and the highest suicide rate out of all of them. So, and I can see it because, you know, you, you lose all your money, you lose all, all, uh, you know, these games and these very bizarre type of endings, you know, you want to jump off a bridge. I mean, I know that I did, you know, I tried a couple times. So it's just, it's a very insidious disease that once you get into it, that you have a very, very uh, moderate chance. We'll, we'll, we'll say that of going down that slippery slope that I did, because like I said, there are going to be the, the certain percentage of people then up end up like me. 
I mean, there are the people that will, you know, lose. Hopefully they lose right away, especially the new gamblers. So that way they don't want to keep doing it. But the ones yeah. that win, and <laughs> win and lose, then, you know, you never yeah. know what's going to happen. I- I'm lucky their gambling never was something. I mean, my thing was drinking and drugs, but gambling just, I, you know, walk into a casino. I'm like, this is taking too long. I like the quick fix. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's taking way too long. So, yeah, it's different for everybody. And it's unfortunate, you know, like if you do have a gambling addiction, you know, we're a Canadian show. I mean, they're, each province has their own gambling hotlines and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, it's like, you know, uh, a pamphlet and some 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 counseling but really you know we've always struggled to help gamblers access treatment there really is no uh, inpatient services for people with gambling addiction that are severe gambling addiction i mean you, you know you did what you did but some people just you know they never stop and and then it leads into drug abuse because then they want to stay awake to keep gambling especially uh you know all hours of the morning so you wrote a book um it's called never enough zeros um and uh, you wrote it with someone philip maybe you can tell us a little bit about that so so is this for what's your goal with the book so my goal for the book is to be uh, a lifeline for people just like it is for me believe it or not i go to spotify every day and i listen to the book because it talks about all the trials and tribulations that i've been through because of gambling. So whether you're, you're just getting started or you've been in it for a while or you're, you're at the end of your rope, this book will serve as a lifeline. It will tell you exactly what you need to hear because I've been through the whole gamut, the ups, the downs, the you know, prison, the you know, attempted suicides, And it's all because of sports gambling. So when you read it, you're going to be like, oh, wow, there's someone else like me that has went through the same exact things. And they're on the other end now. They're really trying to quit this thing that is not only taking their money, but it's taking their time. It's taking their family. It has taken everything from their being. And it really, really helped me in order to to gain my sobriety. And if I don't read it or if I don't listen to it every day, then there's a chance that I could go back to, you know, the gambling because I did it for so long and I loved it. So I'm just trying to help, you know, myself first. I know that sounds selfish, but then it actually helps other people too. I've had a lot of people calling me on this and a lot of people messaging me that, you know, thank God you wrote that book because I went through the same exact things that you did. And, you know, this is helping me, you know, stay sober. Yeah. And, and it's usually that, that first process when, when someone relates to someone else's story, uh, you know, kind of breaks that, that thought of like, no one will understand. And, you know, like I'm in too deep and I, you know, I can't get out of this. Um, you know, hearing you share your story hopefully relates with others and, and, and now they can ask that question. And my, you know, what would you say to someone, okay, who say, okay, I got a problem. I, yeah. I've gone through everything you've, you've, you've just talked about, but how do I actually stop? Like you described you know, smashing your laptop, uh, you know, your phone is starting to write. I mean, it, in, in other words, does somebody need to give up their, their mobile devices completely? Is, is that like a, a first part of the step? Like, what is that, that first day, that first week look like in your suggestions to, to someone? First of all, it's, it's very difficult. Okay. Let's, be very transparent, especially if you've done it for some time, because you just, you know, that feeling, the rush, and uh, you're just so involved in it. And, you know, to, to boot, you know, everywhere you look, at least here in, in the States, there's, there's signs, there's commercials, every game that's on TV, there's like 10 commercials for FanDuel, DraftKings. And then, you know, I don't know if they have this in Canada yet, but they're ha- starting here. And I, 
I called that this was going to happen. There's going to be sports books in every single sporting event. So all the stadiums, you're going to be able to, you know, get a hot dog and place your bet. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. But, you know, I think that, you know, the people that have been doing it for a while, unfortunately, you know, they almost have to hit a rock bottom, you know, because it's that difficult of an addiction to quit. Because it's, it's something that if you just, you know, lose some money, you just think, okay, I'm going to win it back. And then you lose more and then you're constantly chasing. So I don't really have an answer to that question, except, you know, my book has helped me quit. Um, You know, I guess you could reach, you can reach out to Gamblers Anonymous. You can, you know, they have things on the phone now. I think it's called Gamban where you can block all the, uh, sports gambling websites you can join uh gamblers anonymous you can reach out to people like you know dan fields who i talked about earlier in the program um that uh, specializes in gambling therapy and i think what you're going to see fellas is more and more states legalize it here in the united states it's going to be a huge problem and you're going to have a lot of you know not only more therapists but you're going to have in-house, you know, just like you go to a, a, a drug or alcohol rehab, you're going to see gambling rehabs pop up everywhere. I can, I can already see that happening. And before any of that, you're going to have that many more broken families, that many more suicides, that many more, you know, in, disrupted, in, in, you know, lost jobs. I, I mean, it, it comes with so much as, as you've, as you've explained. Um, what do you, like, in, in your in your experience in your writing I mean is there a way of determining you know before the big crash before the big loss before the you know the story that you've just you know lost your house and, and you got to tell your family like is there is there any way of identifying like it's gonna be you like would you say that yeah. like anybody that just goes and plays, online right now is going to become addicted like i mean what's your, what's your story to somebody who's thinking about yeah maybe i can make a couple hundred bucks this weekend if i if i try this site out you know m- my recommendation would be not to start first of all. <laughs> there you go okay i figured you'd the, do that <laughs> yeah because you know maybe i'm the wrong person to ask because i feel once you get started and God forbid you start winning a little bit. I think it's, it's, it's very, very hard to quit. I mean, I saw the signs. I mean, listen, I lost my house. I lost my business. I lost, you know, I stole from my family and I knew what I was doing and I knew where this thing was going to end up. I ended up in jail. I get out of jail and I still gamble because that's how, how much of a hold this thing has on you. I mean, yeah. like I said, I never did drugs. I never did alcohol. I don't know what those addictions are, but this one is an animal. And it's, it's just, you know, that, that winning and winning, let's say $500 and you're an 18 year old, right? And it takes you literally, you know, five minutes because you, yeah. bet, a, you bet a first inning on a baseball game. Or you bet, you know, a first quarter on a football game. You know, are you going to want to do do that? Or are you going to want to go work for $12 an hour somewhere? Right? right. So it just get, it gets to the point where you just think that once you did it once and you won, that you can keep doing it. And, and it's cool, right? Gambling is cool. It's accepted among, you know, your friends and everybody does it. So it ends up to the point where you start losing and you start losing things. And in some cases, like myself, you already know the end result. You know that you're going to end up, you know, either in jail, homeless or committing suicide, but you still do it because you have that, that rush and that belief in your mind that you're going to get on a streak and you're going to win it all back. I mean, listen, I've literally lost probably 15, $20 million easily, you know, and that's documented um, that Jeez. I would think up until six months ago. Oh yeah, man. I had multi-million dollar businesses um, up until six months ago. I thought I was going to get on a run and win it all back. Cause I, I quit 
you know, March 13th. I mean, I only have, you know, a little over what, six months of sobriety. So my mental sure. state, my mental state was, we're going to win it all back. Don't worry. I'm going to work. That's what I told myself. So I think that's, that's the big problem. And what people need to realize is the money is not coming back and you have to tell yourself, okay, that's done. It's not coming back. I'm losing my family. I'm losing my friends. You know, I need to quit. So to answer your question, those are some of the signs when you start losing things, then then you're really starting to go down that slippery slope. I'm just wondering, Joel, you know, you started with sports betting. Were, were you a fan on a specific team in the beginning? Like, are you a fan now? Do you, do you, you know, need to watch, like, is it a struggle for you to not to watch a sport? Like, or are you surpassed being any specific team supporter? Like, it's just, you yeah. can't watch sports. That is another great question. And I told someone this the other day. I grew up in, you know, in the Detroit area. I loved the Red Wings. I loved the Tigers. I loved, you know, the Lions, the Pistons, all the Detroit teams, right? In the 80s, you know, the Pistons, the bad boys, you know, right. obviously we, we won back to back. And the Red Wings were good. Um so yes, I love those teams. Okay. But once I started sports gambling and once those teams started losing, when I placed money on them, I ended up hating the teams that I loved, you know, right. and, and people have asked me that question. I don't have any favorite teams. You know, my favorite team was the team that I bet on that day, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it, it takes everything away from you, you know? I mean, and it's sad because I used to, 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 to love those teams. And maybe now that, you know, I've quit, maybe that'll come back. I'm hoping that it could come back. Right now, I'm not watching any sports or listening to any, you know, sports radio or ESPN because, you know, I think I'm still so young in the, in the recovery that I would get triggered real quick. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and I yeah. would assume that that's a, that's sort of a, a, a big sign too, that, you know, you're no longer wearing the, the Jersey of, of the, the, you know, the city team that, that you're rooting for and having, you know, your few friends over and ordering a pizza now, like that Jersey is probably in the closet. You got four different games going on and it, you know, now you're starting to bet on who's going to hit the longest drive in golf. Like, you know, it just gets to that obsessive compulsive aspect of it yeah i really hope like when you talked about how they're going to be putting opportunities to bet right when you can buy a hot dog like i hope that changes the game experience for a lot of people where they're like i because people that's that um bet on sports aren't necessarily the same people that go to the arenas and do that energy of like, you know, everybody's wearing the same color shirts and waving towels or whatever the case may be. I mean, I think those are different people than the ones that are actually gambling on the sport. So I'm hoping that that, you know, gets, gets like, I'm sure a lot of partners go to games together. I don't think they're going to be too happy. You know, your, your honey goes and buys a hot dog and spends 50 bucks on a bet. This is not only were the tickets, $300, uh, you know, this has turned into a $3,000 night. Uh, I don't think people are ready for that. Uh, you know, other than the big players that are spending big bucks on tickets, but hopefully it bounces back at them. I, I think it just takes away from the whole idea of the game. You know, mm-hmm. so, you know, maybe they'll just get too greedy that it, it all implodes on itself. So, you know, uh, so I, oh, who's, um, sorry, who's the co author? It was a Philip. I, I shut the image yeah. down. Phillip. Who's Philip? Philip White. Um, you know, what happened was, you know, I had all these thoughts and everything written on pieces of paper. So I said, I'm not going to be able to write this book myself. So, I just went around and talked to people and they told me about this guy that, you know, had done some work for them that uh, they had wrote some books and they referred him and, and he helped me write the book. And, you know, he took all my scribble notes and then he would, you know, record me and ask me questions. And that's how the, the book came about. And, you know, that's how I met Philip. He's a great guy. And, 
you know, he's helped me in my journey, not only, you know, with writing the book, but also, you know, with abstaining from gambling as well. Now he's very passionate about this as well. So yeah, we're, we're you, definitely a team. Well, you, you, you lucked out on that one. Looks like that's a good, uh, a good opportunity for you to move forward. You know, I just want to, so want to acknowledge your description of your addiction to gambling was yeah. very powerful. And I mean, you could replace the word gambling with anything else. And you right. know, that's why I think North America is in this addiction crisis because we mm-hmm. focus on the actual thing people are addicted to and really like you can't give you a pill to you know not be a gambling addict and 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 you're trying to i think that's why gambling addiction is so down here because really there's nothing to prescribe there's no money to be made off gambling addiction like there is opioid addictions tons of money being made on opioid addictions by medications and big pharma but you know until right. big pharma finds a pill for gambling addiction there isn't going to be any gambling addiction treatment so you know i really appreciate that 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 raw definition because it I, I mean, I get it, you know, I totally get it. And it's just that like, it, it's always going to be different the next time. And, and the reality is, it's like, it, it just isn't, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, and, you know, we need to figure out how to break that cycle for, for people to, to, to stop that. Cause it's not going to be different. And so I'm glad that you found it in, in, in writing your book. You know, we talk about many pathways to recovery and uh, there are many and, and glad that this was an opportunity for you to, to get well and to help others is very important um you know giving back is is a way to to keep peace in your mind and so forth you know uh, before we let you go at the beginning of the show we were talking about in canada we just got launched uh, the proclamation that september is going to be recovery month in canada from now on and um it's a big deal they tried three times to get a motion passed and twice it was denied which was kind of odd and so the third time you know they finally voted yes and it's so it's a federal Role kind of proclamation and and the social media banter was just like what for who cares you know that kind of stuff and like why do you need a recovery month and so i thought i'd even have you on there because like you said when you were in your 20s you had no idea there was no message out there like hey no. there's this thing called recovery like there, there was no message out there so uh, you, you know darren if you can you know to me, it's important because it's like the converse, conversations of, of, of opportunities to, to do things differently is so important, like you just did with your book, you know, letting people know this is my lived experience. And if you relate, maybe we can get through this together. Um, right. You know, do you, do you, is, is Darren, what do you, what's, what's your answer to somebody that says, oh, why do you need a recovery month? Well, I, I mean, for so long, you know, and as as Joel has alluded to, you know, the gambling addiction is just something that you seem to figure out when it's a huge problem and then and then don't know where to go to and ashamed of bringing your family in. And, you know, there's there's no, you know, gambling assistance resource center down the road that welcomes everybody. You know, it's and, and it's and it's true for a lot of it. Um it's this thing that as an individual, once we, once we find that there's a problem in our lives and it's so big that we can't do anything about it all, all on our own, like that's, that's when, you know, lives are destroyed. And, and, you know, I, I just think that having a proclamation of recovery is like, it, it's almost like we don't matter what you're addicted to. Yeah, but let's let's begin the conversation of there's help, mm-hmm. period, and let's and let's celebrate, let's discuss, let's let's you know advertise that idea mm-hmm. that it is that it is there for yeah for nothing specific for anything for everything you know and- it, even the idea of abstaining from gaming. I mean, I don't know right. what it's like for you, Joel, in the states, but the gambling programs we have here, it's it's. At nowhere in the literature does it say in like the provincial kind of, you know, gaming help abstaining. It's all, you know, uh, what's it called? Moderation. Responsible gaming, <laughs> responsible right. gaming. So, Joel, why don't you just responsibly gamble? 
yeah, that's not going to happen, you know. And <laughs> and getting getting back to Darren, doesn't it I, sound ludicrous? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, it's 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 ludicrous, right? And Darren, getting back to you, you know, before I lose my train of thought, not only did I put the the shirt back in the closet, but I ripped up any Detroit stuff. So <laughs> that, that's it. And then another another answer is, you know, how do you know you have a problem? with your your sports gambling when you're betting hundreds or thousands of dollars on like uh international women's basketball or 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 curling or just some obscure event that you know nothing about you know oh my goodness that's another red flag and and it gets to that it does because when when you're in action right you know especially nowadays with all of these new providers you're, you know, you have nothing to bet on at like 11 or 12 o'clock, meaning like, you know, American sports or Canadian sports. So now you're betting Chinese tennis, you're betting, you know, Russian ping pong, you're betting whatever it is that you're, you're betting, but you're betting on it just because of the action. And that's what it gets to be. Wow. Oh, that's, that's the addiction. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate uh, you, Joel Soper. Um, again, the book is uh, Never Enough Zeros, A Tale of Tragedy and Inspiration in the Struggle Against Gambling Addiction. Uh, I mean, such an important, very specific, you know, topic. Um, but again, like Giuseppe alluded to, like, it relates, you know, in there when it when it's happening in our lives when we're addicted when we're when we're keeping secrets when we're feeling despair it relates all across the board uh you know to a point where it doesn't matter exactly what we're what we're uh addicted to and and that's and that's important and that's important in the you know in the term of recovery uh being yeah whether it's abstinence whether it's Less responsible gaming you know what you're doing responsible <laughs> whether it's 12 step whether it's and, and and some people can responsible gamble and all that kind of stuff we're just joking about it because they think yeah. oh why can't we all just do it so how do people find your book how do people find you what's your socials where's your website okay so here we go thank you for that um first of all you can find the book on the internet you know amazon just typing in never enough zeros it's O E S on zeros, uh, Spotify. Um, I will have people literally reach out to me via email. Um, you know, my email is Joel at never enough zeros.com. You can go to our website, never enough zeros.com and, you know, reach out to me, you know, ask me questions. If you know, you know, someone or yourself that has a gambling problem, then I can help you. And in turn, that helps me, if that makes sense. That makes sense to me. I mean, that's a, that's a big part of it. Joel, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's fair to, to feel the desire to help other people when, when you've, you know, gotten through that, that uh, ability to, you know, to, to stop and to, to find something different and to put it all down and, and to have a little control in, our, in, in your life as to, uh, you know, something that's taken over for so many years. Um, so good, good luck. And, and, yeah. and good luck on going, that. Yeah. Man. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's, it's okay to say good luck to a gambling <laughs> addict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I never even thought about that. <laughs> I don't know either, but you know, yeah. I, you know, I, I think that, that I do need a little of that as well. Uh, you know? I didn't. I didn't get much of it, Darren, when I was gambling. So hopefully, yeah. I, ho- right hopefully, on. I'll get yeah. it in recovery. Nice. Well, thanks for being on the show, and uh, thanks for everybody for listening. You can catch us on all your favorite streaming devices, from Spotify to iTunes. To, and if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, click subscribe and like us. And if you're on Facebook Live watching us, thank you. And special shout out to uh, Vancouver Co-op Radio 100.5 FM. That gives us an hour every Thursday to talk about recovery. Darren, good to see you. Thank Joel, you. thanks for being on the show. And from the New West Recovery Community, everybody have a great day. Take care. Bye. Bye.